Welcome to the Death, Taxes and Change podcast, the podcast where the certain things in life meets the uncertainty of discussion. And we are really privileged today to have with us in the studio, Mr. J.P. Cater, a very good friend of mine. J.P., welcome here today. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. It's a privilege being here. It's really, really awesome having you here, JP. So, uh, like we said, uh, the Death, Tax- Taxes and Change podcast is a brand new podcast that Pod Media is hosting. And basically what we're trying to do through this podcast is to have some meaningful discussions with a variety of people from all over South Africa. And it's really an honor for us to have you here for, as one of our first guests. So, JP, to, to start off the, the discussion, obviously death, it sounds, you know, it's quite a nasty word and it's something that people aren't obviously comfortable speaking about. But I don't think we necessarily want to just focus on, on death per se, but more about your life view. How, how do you see your religious view? How do you see the world and, and how do you make sense of all of this craziness that we see around us? Daniel, once again, thank you very much for having me. Like I said earlier on, it's a privilege and a huge honor for me to be here. And uh, th- and, and well done to you guys for this wonderful in- uh, initiative. Well, um, I am I am a Christian. My worldview is that of a Christian worldview. My life changed completely. Now, I was raised in a Christian household. I'm the youngest of four kids. Uh, my mother, my father still resides in my hometown, Utenek, in the Eastern Cape. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the youngest of four kids. I've got a brother and two older sisters. My other sister lives here in Pretoria and my brother in PE. And uh, my older sister lives in Utenek uh, as well. So I come from a small industrial town, Utenek. Everybody knows it for VW and so on. <laughs> and I was raised in, uh, in a Christian household, in a Christian community, Christian household, and my parents did their utmost best to raise me in, 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 in a Christian way, you know. Up until the point came where I had to make a decision for myself. And that point came when I was 19 years old. So my life changed completely when I said to my parents, you know, thank you very much for the wonderful, wonderful uh, um, uh, gift you gave me. And that was uh, by introducing me to the Christian faith as a child. But now it's time for me to take up. Uh, my cross and, and, and to follow Christ and to make a decision. So I completely made a decision on, in August 1997 to follow Jesus Christ and uh, as my personal Lord and Savior. So, so I'm born again. And um, bef- so that's when my worldview changed. Before then, I had a very um, uh, 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 humanistic worldview. You know, all things go, you know, and, uh, and I, 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 I can still remember. And when I think back now, um, I'm, quite, I'm quite embarrassed, but I can still remember at school. I was quite, I was really politically inclined at school. And um, so when once, once we had in, in, in our English class, we, we had uh, like a debate. And um, I was the only one that was for abortion back then. And, uh, and so, and I tried to convince, and I convinced people with, with really with, uh, with a humanistic worldview, you know, appeal to their emotions with a humanistic worldview, and, 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 and convinced a lot of people in the class. And only a year after that, that was in my, in my last year, in my, in my matric year, and then only a year after that, in 1997, I gave my life to the Lord, and ever since I regret that day, you know, uh, I, I regret that debate because only now I see how foolish I am. So my worldview, to get back to your question, my worldview is that of a, I've got I've got a Christian worldview, uh, a very strong Christian worldview, um, and uh, you know, um, like I said, I'm born again. I'm not just religious. I'm born again. And um, people would, if you have to define me, people in, in the Christian setup, people would say, I go to Happy Clappy Church, mm-hmm. you know. So, so yeah, not, not that, that, is, that is important. I'm a strong believer that, you know, as the Bible teaches us, you know, that, that our bodies, we are, you know, the temple of God. And, 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 and what I call, what I refer to Sunday gatherings is just that. It's a gathering of believers, you know, where we give uh, uh, corporate praise unto God, you know. And, 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 and so, but I believe that, that, that you're, you are the temple of God. So, yeah, that's my worldview. So everything around me is shaped by my Christian worldview. And, um, and, and, and um, everything I do is shaped, and I do it from that point of departure. Um, so if I can ask on that question, looking at the entertainment industry, I mean, that's an, an industry that goes 
far and wide and you've got a, a, a massive array of, of different people and nowadays it isn't something weird to see a sporting team with three or four different religions represented and I mean that's good that we can cooperate amongst differences but how do you incorporate your worldview into your job which is a job that that doesn't only cater for for Christian people it's a very good question thank you for the question Paul um, I had a, I had a, one of my mentors I had I had a lot of mentors in in, in the faith and in in the industry as well and uh, one of the mentors in PE, when I was just starting out with a, with, a, with a community radio station, and I must actually give you the testimony of how I started out, uh, if, we, if we can get there. Because everything that I'm doing now, the whole thing of me starting out in the radio, in TV, a broadcasting industry, was a command by God. People told me I was crazy. Pe- I, I told people, God told me to present sports on TV. And um, so I'm going to get back to that. But how, how, how do I incorporate my worldview, my faith? You know, um, so one of my mentors was a guy called Billy Paulson. Now, a lot of people in the gospel community will know Billy Paulson. He wrote a lot of songs, and one of his famous songs that he wrote and, uh, and or composed and, uh, and was sung by a lot of artists is a song called Mordes Alison Wierskein. And I think uh, Sonia Harold also recorded the song, and the song is quite uh, well known amongst uh, especially believers. So he had, he told me very early in my career, you know, that the industry, or any industry for that matter, stands on three legs. First leg is artistry. Second leg is industry. And the third leg is ministry. Whether you're an accountant, whether you're a musician, whether you find yourself in the entertainment industry, you must first of all decide where you're going to fit in in the industry, in any industry. If we can get back to the three legs that he mentioned. First one is artistry. Normally, in, in in music, it will be your jazz musicians or your or your um, opera musicians. You know, uh, people want to perfect the art. Uh, normally, you'll find them in theaters. People will perfect the art of what they're busy doing. You find it in any industry. You know, you find it in an accountancy or in in law or whatever. You'll find a guy who say, "I want to perfect the this art." You know, a, a jazz musician will not care if anybody comes to his show or if he sells any CDs, as long as he knows he has perfected this specific note, you know, and he, he, he has perfected that art. So you find people who's called for that, you know, who says, and people will look at them and say, but it's, it's a waste of time. This guy's got three PhDs, or this guy, now, you know, he's, a be- he, he can, he's got beautiful vocals, he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful singer, but he, he's wasting his, his time. He's sitting in, 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 in a granny flat somewhere and he's just composing all the time, composing new music, you know, coming up with new literature all the time. They've been called for the, 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 the artistry of what they, are, what they are doing to come back to the entertainment industry. So you, you find them in jazz music. You find them in theaters. They don't want to be on TV, you know, and all of that. Then you, then, then you get industry. You get a guy who says, you know what? I know I can't sing. I don't care. What anybody says, I just want to make a living out of this. So I'm going to sell 25,000 CDs. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. You know, I'll even sell my soul if that's what it takes. I'll sing anything as long as people can buy my CDs, as long as people come to my concerts. I am in this for the industry. I am in this for, to make a living out of it. Then um, th- thirdly, you know, you, you, the third leg is ministry. Now, ministry isn't. Uh, necessarily you standing behind the pulpit and preaching. Ministry can be the person, the drama student, who went to study drama at University of Pretoria or Stellenbosch or wherever, and got a degree, who's an accountant, who's a presenter, radio presenter, but they've been called to impart their gift into others. So you'll find them in their community doing a normal job, but after hours, they're busy teaching kids in the community or Somewhere at an old age home, you know, with a qualification, same qualification as a guy who's selling millions of CDs, but he's been called for something else. So it's very important to do. First of all, if you want to get into the entertainment industry, is to find out where do you fit in there. Um, then also, you know, people always ask me, how do you how do you manage, you know, this people that come from other religions and so on. Where I grew up, uh, I saw the most beautiful. A description, um, an example of Christianity. Because where I grew up, um, I grew up in an area where we, we had Muslim people and Jewish people. 
you know, of all religion, people of all religions, living up in, uh, growing up in one community, living in one community, going to the same school in many households, in one, uh, people, different religions in one household, you know. And um, that taught me one beautiful thing about a Christian religion, that you can be, you can tolerate a person and love a person and accept a person without having to accept what they stand for. Just because you tolerate somebody and just because you love somebody doesn't mean you agree with what they're doing, you know. And uh, so so that also helps me in the industry a lot, you know, where you get people with contrasting views, you know, people that differ from you. Um, um, I've learned to tolerate people that come from different backgrounds. Um, I've learned to, 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 to get to know the person, you know, um, eyesight, Eyesight is, is, is overrated. You know, vision is very important. You know, um, I've learned early in life, God has told me, God told me early in life and he taught me in life that sometimes your purpose is locked up in somebody that does not look similar to you. So by looking with your eyesight, by looking at a person, the way you see him or the way the world wants you to see them, you can miss your purpose. Your next business deal can be in somebody's uh, hands that, that does not look similar to you. Your, your future wife, you know, um, uh, get back to Moses, you know. Moses himself married a woman from Ethiopia. I mean, if it wasn't for Zipporah's father, Jethro, he would never have survived in the desert with all those people. Jethro gave him the best advice in the desert. And so you can go on sometimes because God doesn't look like me. He, do, he doesn't look at people the way we look at people. Yeah. You know, he looks at people... Uh, uh, um, at, at their hearts, you know, yeah. God is a God of purpose. So, so JP, I think this uh, gets us actually quite neatly to the, the next part of, of this discussion uh, regarding, obviously, this has an impact and influence on how you view our world at the moment. Mm -hmm. So how you view, and, and uh, I mean, uh, politics is interesting, but party politics isn't interesting. What's interesting is political philosophy. How, how do you see, and, and how does this filter into how you view governments how you view uh, uh, view authority how you view um the way our whole community and world is structured once again uh, it's, it's a very good in, uh, and an interesting question um, daniel but once again my worldview obviously how i grew up now my 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 second name is biko mm. named after about to stephen biko in the eastern cape my parents were very uh inclined politically inclined and they were involved in the black consciousness movement. Mm. Now, the black consciousness movement was a beautiful movement, especially under Stephen Bantubiko. It was never about people. It was always about a system. Even up until today, Stephen would have fought the system. He never fought uh, any group of people. Never. Uh, and he was clear about it. And that's how we were raised. That's the type of politics we knew. We never knew the other liberation movements, you know, um, in the Eastern Cape, where I come from, that part of the Eastern Cape. On the other side of the Fish River, uh, people might know of the, S, uh, of, 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 of the ANC and other movements. We never knew about that. We always knew about the black consciousness movement and about Stephen Bantubiko, you know, and uh, Robert Subukwe and, you know, those guys. Uh, so... That was that was where I learned politics for the first time. And it was a beautiful philosophy. Mm -hmm. It was a philosophy of saying that everybody is beautiful the way you've been designed, uniquely designed. Um, you know, um, Stephen's thing, like I said, was never about people. It was always about the system. We must mm -hmm. fight the system. As a matter of fact, I think it's uh, Professor Herman Giliomir at uh, University of Stellenbosch who admits and says that we have made a big mistake by getting rid or, or by uh, losing Stephen Bantubiko. Because he wa Stephen Bantubiko once said that with Afrikaans, I can live and work because it was a language that was developed on the African continent. Afrikaans and all its speakers are part of me and I'm part of them and part of the language. And that was the way he, 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 he did things, you know. And so to get back to your question, so... I was raised to always fight injustice, no matter who, um, who's, the, who's the victim, you know, what their background, their religion. If injustice happens, you must fight injustice. Um, you must always fight for the vulnerable, you know, and stand in their corner and help them, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're colored. So that was my, um, this, this part of my makeup. Mm. In politics, then once again, my my faith also shaped a lot of it, and uh, so 
for me, I would say we have a where I have a problem besides um, party politics. Um, I've got a big problem with party politics. We've got a systemic problem when it comes to politics in South Africa and world politics, and it's a lot of it comes out of party politics. You know, because one thing party politics push is not really philosophy; it is identity. You know, um, yeah, especially in South Africa, where people tend to vote according to identity. Parties say it isn't so, and all people vote for this party. But essentially, we see that a lot of people from a certain ethnic group vote for a certain party, and that's something that's happening, and that probably will continue happening. It's not, I just want to get in there. It's not just that certain people vote for a single party. I mean, all basically all parties in South Africa, according to me, practice identity politics. I mean, yeah, you, you, it's and a lot of their names, literally the party names, you see the identity. Yeah, they aim at a certain group. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that for me, I've got a big problem with that because. Um, by doing that, it is actually petty politics. Mm. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, if you go back to the days, like I'm saying, the days of, of Biko, for instance, it was, it was marvelous. It was brilliant minds. You know, these guys could, could really come up with philosophies that will better not only mankind, but South Africa. You know, they had, they had solutions to, to make this country a better country, to work, you know, uh, and not only Biko, but there was a lot of other people as well. So I've got a big problem with party politics at this point in time um, and, and the direction we're going in. Besides the party politics that we have nowadays, we've got populism, you know, the, you know people making uh, a lot of uh, populist statements. And, 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 and it's quite sad because um, we, we are better than that. We can do better than that. And um, if you have to ask me now, I would say that um, at this point in time in South Africa, we are not f functioning or operating at our maximum capacity as citizens, um, you know, intellectually in all other areas as well. We are actually the lowest that we can be. And, to, and for me, the fact that the lowest that we can be is acceptable, you know, and, you know, it's acceptable to so many people in our country. That's a big problem. And, 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 and so for me, um, politically, um, I think we can do better as a country. I think we need to do better, be better as a country. If you've ever been poor, I've been poor. You know, I'm still not rich. I'm not a wealthy man, but I've, I've grown up in extreme poverty poor circumstances and my parents always I, I, I still when I when I when I sit down with them and, and I, I, I ask them how did you guys do it you know because it never seemed like we were poor and uh, if you were poor you understand poverty doesn't know skin color you know if you come from if you've been hurt in life you've been really hurt in life you understand that um, uh, uh, hurt and destruction does not ask for skin color. You need to forgive. Everybody needs to forgive. And, and what is forgiveness? You know, People say, and it's a word people use a lot of time, my Christian worldview tells me, as a Christian, you know, it's easy, and I'm still on your political, uh, answering your, polit your question about my political worldview. Um, my, my Christian worldview tells me that it's easy to forgive those who need your forgiveness. Say, for instance, um, you guys insulted me in front of everybody. You really hurt my feelings, and I'm, I'm hurt. And it's easy for me to forgive you guys, you know. Uh, oh, sorry, no, it's easy for you guys to come to me and say, JP, you know, I was in the wrong. Please forgive me. It's very easy to do that. What I've learned in my Christian, from my Christian worldview is that it's the Jesus kind of forgiveness the true kind of forgiveness is to forgive those who do not deserve your forgiveness. It's where the victim can walk up and say to the, the person who committed a horrible crime to them and say, you know what? Um, I don't know what I've done. I don't know what caused you to do it, but I want to say, I forgive you. That's when you need the character of Christ. And for me, yes, um, there's a lot of people that's, that's still walking around with a lot of hurt in South Africa. And we need to talk about a lot of stuff in South Africa. But it starts from a point of forgiving. And not, and not waiting for the perpetrator to come and ask you for forgiveness. Because that not, my Bible teaches me that that's not my duty as a Christian. My duty is to get to a space and a place in my heart and in my life 
where I can go up and say, I am at a point now where I want to say that I forgive you. Mm. Now, there's a difference between, between forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, I'm not, say, I'm not being ignorant. You know? I'm not saying that uh, somebody that's been terribly hurt by a loved one must now all of a sudden reconcile and, uh, you know, take hands and sing, you know, and kumbaya and everything is fine. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying a starting point for a lot of people should be to say, you know what? I'm going to make the decision that I'm going to forgive. And when once, what I've learned in my life is that once you make that decision, you take power back, you know, and you begin the conversation and say, let's go for a cup of coffee. Let's, let's talk. Mm. And here in South Africa, at this point in time, we are not talking. Now, to get back to my political view, <laughs> I am, I am, I must also admit that I am, I am a capitalist. <laughs> I believe in, in, in the, in, in, in the, I'm, I'm somewhat going to tell you about my, my economic views and all of that, <laughs> but I am a capitalist. I believe in the free market system. I believe it's a wonderful, wonderful system. Uh, is the system that, that can also be abused and where corruption takes place? Yes, by all means. But if you, if you, if you, if you uh, manage to do it correctly, and if you're brave enough making the economic decisions and brave enough to make the, the difficult calls by the right ones, it's a system that will work for you and will, will work beautifully so, for you. So, JP, uh, and, uh, so I think this touches on, uh, if you say you're a capitalist, how do you view capitalism in South Africa at the moment? Because I, I think a lot of people would argue that we're not seeing quite a true version of it. Once again, it comes back to uh, po uh, identity politics and party politics. So the ANC in itself is they, they have a, a socialist um, and a communist worldview. But we're in a country that's capitalist. So the problem starts with the governing party at this point in time. So we've got a capitalist system, a neoliberal economic system that we're trying to do. The problem with that is that if you do not do it correctly, if you want to, if you want to, uh, 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 um, how can I say, if you want to uh, 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 cut corners and you don't do it properly, you don't take, make the, the, the difficult calls, you know, not the popular calls, the difficult calls then it's a system that can backfire in your face. Now, so, so our problem at this point in time, this is my view, my, my view is that we are schizophrenic when it comes to our political uh, policies at this point in time. So we've got a puppet master who's got certain philosophies, um, uh, 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 communist and, and, and socialist uh, philosophies and, and beliefs, but playing in, wanting to play in the free market system. The two will never go together. Mm. Um, there is space. I'm a strong believer that there should be space for legislation. You know, legislation should be there. Uh, the playing fields should be equal. You know, um, it's a little bit of space for the government. And, it's, and, 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 and capitalism has always been like that. Always been space for the government to come in and say, this will be our policy. This is what we are doing. But not to come and run the show. And our biggest problem at this point in time is that we've never given in the new dispensation, never really given um, um, uh, the free market system and, and capitalism a real, a real chance. Mm. Um, we've, we've, we, um, like I say, we've got a schizophrenic approach to it, mm. and that it will. If you do it that way, it will never work. Mm. The way we're doing it at this point in time in our country it, uh, forces our our labour market to be quali a qualified, educated labor market. That's why the ANC in our country cannot create jobs for, un for uh, uneducated people. Mm. If, you are not un if you're not educated at this point in time, um, then you won't get a job. And that is because of our policies in mm. our country. And that is because we are not, according to me, ap applying... Uh, uh, um, or adhering to the rules of the free market system. Well, I, I would argue that I don't think South Africa has ever been properly capitalist. I mean, the MP government wasn't capitalist. Uh, they, they were as status as it comes. I mean, exactly. they literally tried to organize every single aspect of every single person's life. Well, that's just what I think. So, so JP, if I can ask you a question, I mean, obviously, I think we've, we've organically moved into the point mm. of change. Um, what change do you think is necessary? If, if, if we were to say, for instance, that uh, you, you had... You were the puppet master for a, for for the next the, the five years. The capitalist puppet puppet the, master. Yes, the the JP party. You got five <laughs> years. Um, what change do you think? Uh, on a, on a serious note, South Africans and South Africa need to work at 
what are the things that, that need to be addressed urgently? I mean, where do you see where, where do you see us having to go? What should be the goalpost? We should move away from, firstly, we should move away from the concept where the government will uh, make, a, make a difference economically and will employ people. That's where the National Party also, you know, uh, made a big mistake, you know, um, where you want to control people and it actually, the system actually backfired because they did a lot of damage to a big part of uh, the economy of this country. Imagine if everybody was involved in South African economy, economy back then, you know, how, how, how well the economy would have done. So, so, and who knows, maybe, you know, would have still, still, things, things would have been the same, you know, and, uh, but, so, for me, number one, the government is not, must, must not try to play the part of um, the, the, the providing employment um, that, that is the job of the, of, of the private sector. I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. And, private, and the private sector knows what to do. They know how to do that. First, there's the first thing. Secondly, we m- must move away in this country from monopolies. Um, if you look at our government at this point in time, they, we, they're running a lot of the monopolies. If you look at the PIC, people are talking uh, about uh, white monopoly capital. There's no such thing in South Africa at this point in time, if you're being honest with yourself. The PIC, um, which is uh, the Public the, Investment Corporation, yeah, the Public Investment Corporation, mm-hmm. uh, the investment arm of the government, they own a lot of shares and big stakes in a lot of our major companies that used to be previously dominated and owned by white people. So you look at your shop rights. You look at, and that is the uh, government employment. Uh, 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 um, uh, government workers uh, pension fund, pension fund mm-hmm. that's invested. Uh, that they that they play with and they invest in there. So you find out that they control almost all the monopolies. Where there are monopolies in South Africa, that's a big problem in South yes, Africa. Yes, it is. And, and 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 the other thing is, I mean, ESCOM. Do we really still need only ESCOM? You know, uh, when are we going to allow? If we've allowed, if we've privatized, you know, certain section of our 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 our. our um, Talk about our electricity for that. For that, month. you know, we wouldn't have been in this crisis for now. And um, I'm not saying that you must, like I said earlier, the government does have a place, you know, and uh, they have a place in the economy, and their place should just be able to number one, do the work of the government, and that is to reduce crime. It's all you must do: reduce crime, make sure that the playing field is equal, and not trying to get involved because if you get involved as a government you will always have corruption mm. you will always have corruption and like we see in South Africa at this point in time so for me number one get out the government must get out of a lot of things that they're doing at this point in time it's not a job to create jobs you know the jobs is to make legislation for others to come in who can provide jobs uh, good quality jobs uh, if I have to look I've started a new show now uh, a TV show and it's about you know the agriculture community mm. And about our farmers and all of that. And, and I went home one night and I said to my wife, you know what? I just realized now if government just say to our farmers, you can do everything that they're currently doing. You know, address the issue of land, you know, um, without having to, to, to cause any harm or damage to our economy or to racial relations in South Africa. You can ring fence our 29,000 to 30,000 farmers. You can tell them, you know, if you guys will be exempt from the 15% tax, you will pay 14% tax or 13% tax. We will, um, and I'm not saying, I'm not even, what I'm suggesting is that government mustn't put money, mustn't give money to the farmers. That's not what I'm saying. My solution is you don't even have to use your own money. Tell the farmers, you will be exempt from paying uh, the VAT, um, 15% VAT. You'll pay, or not exempt for that matter, but you will pay 2% less VAT and you'll pay 1% income tax. And what we want in return for that and is to build, uh, is to build. You can then number one um, that money, but it's only if you have a government that's not not corrupt. So uh, we will then pass legislation that that money will then go number one to help farmers that are struggling with drought and all the other um, climate issues and any other issues. And secondly, uh, 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 you guys can then use that money. And, and we will help you with the security systems on, on, on your farms. We will, we, we will be responsib- responsible for that. You can then use that money, number one, to give your 
the, the people working for you, your farm workers, better housing, better accommodation. All the farmers want to do that, but they're saying that we are dying here. We, we don't have money to do it. So, um, and, and, and obviously, to, to, we must draw foreign investment, but from the right countries. Mm-hmm. We can't, not everybody that comes and says, you know, uh, we're here to help you guys, w- want, to help out, uh, want to help us. And we must, de- we, must, we must decide who our friends are, you know, and, and, and stick with it. Um, a good example is, is the American president. I know a lot of people don't like him, you know, and, he's not a, and, I, and I can understand why a lot of people don't like him because of, 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 of um, some of the stuff that he says. But every now and again, you need a guy who says, us first, you know, us first, South Africans first. Let's solve our crime. Let's make sure that everybody's got enough money to spend the money in the economy, you know. And the only way we can do that, I believe, is by drawing investors, overseas investors. So, so JP, you, uh, f- through your work, obviously, like you said, you're doing this agriculture program. So you see, you see these 29,000 farmers, I mean, each and every day. That, that's your job. But you're not from a farming family, firstly. And, and secondly, you're from the media. So you're not from the industry, if, if you can call it that, even though you're now heavily involved in it. Do you, what are the challenges that you, as almost I want to call it an outsider, what challenges do you see these farmers face? I mean, you you know from first hand experience visiting these people, the the things that they not only go through but the challenges they that they face to literally feed our country. It's a lot of challenges, you know. Um, I really I said to one farmer last week, I said to him, you know, my heart goes out to you guys. When you when you when you get to know our farmers, you begin to see what beautiful hearts they have and brilliant people they are you know and if you get your information most of the time from our mainstream media you will get the wrong story or the wrong information um our farmers really want to help the country that's firstly the first thing i see secondly i see them they're very close to their god and to the land you know um and then thirdly they want to help everybody now what I found, I listened to a farmer. We went uh, to to uh, Amsterdam uh, in uh, in Pumalanga uh, the other day, and I listened to a farmer speaking to his workers. You should see what this guy have done there on his farm. You know um, how well he treats his people. When he when he talks to them, he talks to them in uh, in in Vanek, You know he he speaks to them in in, in Zulu in Isi Zulu, and um, he understands them. And he wants to help them and he wants to give them the best. So that's the first thing that I realized about our farmers. You know, wonderful people, loving people, tough. They're really tough, you know. It's, it's difficult um, conditions out there. So the, 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 the stuff that they face on a daily basis, what I saw is firstly, the climate, you know, uh, the factors that go with it, drought. Um, it's a big crisis for our farmers, um, financial issues. For our farmers, and then the biggest thing is legislation, government. That our farmers. If you're a farmer, you 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 will be hesitant to invest in your farm because people are talking about taking your land. You know that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, if you're a farmer and you are like a fourth or, th- or fifth generation farmer, um, you'll think about your kids can't, must not continue in a country like this. So all that knowledge will just go away. You know, um, you want to build schools for your people. You can't, you know, because of certain talks going on. So that's why I'm a firm believer that we can do both. We can address the land issue because let's be honest. And what I've seen is that the people that's accused of taking the land are the, are the, are the people that actually want to sit around the table and talk. You know, what, what I've realized is that these people want to talk because when all the land were taken and stolen, you know, and, uh, and we must start there. Not everything was taken or stolen. So let's start there. And, 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 and so I see that in our farmers. I see that our farmers want to cooperate. This specific farmer that I'm talking about, what he did is he created an, an agri-village for his workers. So each one of them got, he gave away 10% of his farm. So each one of them got one, one hectare. And uh, he, they, then they also gave them a section where they are farming as well. You know, and they they they're getting good returns. They're making 
um, a good living for them and the offsprings. And he created um, uh, a school, established a school there for them as well. He tried to get a government involved. Not once did the government get involved. And up until today, he had to do everything himself. So I've, I see people that's really struggling out there. Um, I've heard about one farmer. He had a piggery in, in Botovo. And, you know, because of the drought and everything that goes with it, the political noise, you know, people are making about the land. In December, his father shot himself, and he shot himself last last month, a month after his father shot himself. He just shot himself as well. Um, you know, and that is, that is sad. That is the reality. So you're sitting with people. They're very vulnerable out there. And I believe that government, our government can do, can do a lot more to help our farmers. Our farmers want to talk. That's what I've seen. They want to help people. They want to establish communities because they know that's the only way they can go, they can go on. You know, a lot of our people talk about farms in Australia until you get there, you know, and that's what our farmers know. I mean, they aren't as tough as our people. Yes, the farm workers really work hard in Australia, but and in other countries, but um, our farmers are not being helped by the government, subsidized by the government, whereas in Spain, France, and Australia, those countries, those farmers are so used to being bailed out by the government. Mm. Our farmers make a living and they provide food for us in terrible conditions on their own by no support from the government. Mm. So, um, so our farmers go over there and then they realize when they get there, it's not what I have in mind. You know, number one, um, I can, I can, I'm, I'm used to working a lot harder than these people, but I'm not really appreciated by these people. And I, I've heard of a lot of farmers ever since I've been doing this show that says that we want to come back. Hmm. So Africa is where we want to be. You know, um, we don't want to be in other countries. It's, it's not the same as being at home. Hmm. Um, you know, so our farmers are used to uh, tough conditions, but I believe our government can do a lot to, to, to help them. So, JB, just to, to wrap up this discussion in the last five minutes, um, and, and again, touching on the subject of change, are you hopeful in, in South Africa? I mean, how, how do you view South Africa and, and where do you think we're going? Daniel, I'm, 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 I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful about South Africa, the future of South Africa. And I believe South Africans are smarter than this. You know, they can listen and they can yeah, that what these people are saying is nonsense. The populist statements that people are making is nonsense. And I believe South African people, we've come through worse than this. We must just make sure that we act in time, you know, by things like this, what you guys are doing, you know, giving a voice to the voiceless, doing podcasts like this, making your people hear your view you know um we can we can work together in south africa we can live together in south africa we're the only country i normally when i when i when i do talks uh you know make motivational talks or talk about um you know different people from different backgrounds working together i normally so say it's only in south africa where you will find a muslim people with a muslim person with the name of you know rashid uh tarantal <laughs> you know, or, 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 you know, or Muhammad Khadilt, you know, we are a unique people. We know how to live with one another, you know, um, our, uh, Muhammad's veins, uh, Muhammad Khadilt's uh, blood runs through my veins, you know, we are related in different ways, whether you're black, white, you know, or, or, or Indian in South Africa or colored. So, so we, we are unique people in South Africa. I've got a lot of hope. For South Africa, I must be honest with you, our hope does not lie in our politicians or in our politics. They will fail us. I believe South Africans will get to a point where we will have the Arab Spring, you know, uh, not as uh, um, abrupt as theirs were. Or violent. Or violent as theirs Hopefully were. Not, yeah. yeah, not as violent as theirs were. But I believe South Africans, you know, um, will come to a point where they say, we're going to take, we want to take a power now, over power now. We we want to control our own destiny. I, 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 don't, I don't believe people take politicians seriously anymore. Um, you know, a lot of politicians failed the people. And it will be, uh, you know, organizations, you know, like, like how... Um, like the Afri forums, you know, of this world that will actually become be, be, become a voice for people. Uh, people will rely a lot on 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 that. That's my that's my take on it. That people will take power, 
And um, yeah, we will have to do things for ourselves. But I've got a lot of hope and faith in the South African people. Awesome. JP, thank you so, so much for coming in today. We really appreciate your time. I have to say, I think it's been a, a fantastic discussion and it's been insightful. And I think our listeners will agree. Um, so yeah, just just thank you very much. Just for our listeners who want to perhaps follow you, look at your work, where can they find you? Are you on the, the social media sphere? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm, I was forced last year to, to join Facebook. I, 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 I used to be on Facebook when I was still already presented at Eschia. When I left at Eschia in, in 2010, I just went off Facebook. And last year again, I, I had to go on. So I'm, I'm on Facebook under JP Biko Kater. That's my name. And on Twitter, I'm at my Twitter handle is at JP Kater, one word. Uh, Kater is spelled K E Y T E R. And um, on Instagram, uh, my my IG uh, handle is uh, Kater JP. Awesome. Thank you very much. And then uh, to your listener, be, uh, please be sure to subscribe to the Deaf Taxes and Change podcast. Uh, you can subscribe wherever you get your weekly dose of podcasts. As we all know, we all need our hit of podcasts. Leave us a review on iTunes and on CastBox or wherever you find us. And then also follow Pod Media on Facebook. The Death, Taxes and Change podcast is proudly brought to you by Pod Media. <laughs> <laughs>